I'm here with Paul Bradshaw, who runs the MA in Online Journalism at Birmingham City University, where he is a reader in online journalism at the School of Media. He is also currently a visiting professor at the School of Journalism at City University London. Paul has written and contributed to numerous books, in addition to his work for journalism.co.uk, The Guardian and The Telegraph's data blogs, and other media organizations. In addition to running the online journalism blog, he's the founder of HelpMeInvestigate.com, a platform for crowdsourcing investigative journalism. Paul also works as a freelance trainer and speaker. Paul co-authored the Online Journalism Handbook and the third edition of Magazine Editing in Print and Online, both of which came out in 2011. He is also the author and co-author of a number of Lean Pub books, including Scraping for Journalists and 8,000 Holes, How the 2012 Olympic Torch Relay Lost Its Way. In this interview, we're going to talk about Paul's work and interests, as well as the subject and development of his Lean Pub books. At the end of the interview, we'll also talk about his experiences using LeanPub and ways we can improve LeanPub for him and for other authors. So thank you, Paul, for being on the Lean Publishing Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, my first question is, how did you become interested in journalism? Um, <laughs> well, I guess, um, in a sense, I, I, I guess I grew up uh, reading newspapers and being very much aware of the news as a kid and, and I was seen as quite unusual at college as, as being someone who read a newspaper. <laughs> uh, so I, I obviously stood out in that, uh, that, was, that probably says more about the college I went to than, um, than me. Um, and, and, and so I was, I was really more interested in writing and, and, and actually art when I was a kid and, and I kind of drifted into journalism so to speak because uh, because I, I could write and that was a job that I ended up doing uh, I actually wanted to work in radio I didn't have that high opin an opinion of, of journalism when I was um, when I was first working in it um, but um, but I guess um, I, I guess I enjoyed what I did enjoy when I became a journalist was was that ability to to hold power to account in a sense, in that you could represent your readers and, and get results in a way that they couldn't always get themselves individually. So, so that's really, I guess, what gave me a, a bug, if you like. And what was your first job in journalism? Um, I well, I, I kind of worked. I worked for a publisher um, when I was about seventeen, just as just as an admin uh, role. I, I worked for another uh, magazine when I was about 19 in a similar admin role, but my, my first, I guess, um, uh, full journalism role was, was, was a magazine um, reporting on the internet, and, and I, I was very lucky to get a job as an editor um, of that and kind of, kind of grew to become group editor and, and run other editorial operations. And um, why did you eventually make the switch to academia? Well, I, I, I wanted to leave the, the job I was in, um, I'd completed one major project of, of building a series of websites, and I wanted to to move on. and And, and a job came up at um, the university, what's now Birmingham City University. Um, and I originally kind of applied for that with the intention of of it being a bridge to a freelance career, but I actually really enjoyed teaching and 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 learning new skills. So uh, so so that's really, I I guess I never planned to get to go into academia. It was it was something that I um, did initially as as uh, as a uh, like I said as a, as a bridge to something else. But um, uh, but like I said, I, I really enjoy. I still enjoy now learning new skills and and um, and and trying to communicate both in, in the books. Um, you you run the MA in online journalism, um, as I as I mentioned in the intro um, at Birmingham City University, and you say um, I, I watched a video of you talking about it in which you say it's about defining online journalism and shaping the medium for the twenty first century. Can you talk a bit about what the course offers and how it's different from what journalists were taught or needed to learn, say? Um, just a few, maybe even just a few years ago. Well, I, I think um, a lot of journalism education has been set up to meet quite a, a uniform news industry, um, and that's all changed now. Um, you know that the news industry is trying to reinvent itself in reaction to different ways of consuming information and different ways of advertising as well. So. What I wanted to do with the MA was, I guess the realisation I had was that 
sending out students with identical skills um, was not going to help the news industry or the students themselves. Um, so it's, it's the, the people who are going into the news industry now are the people that are finding out how it can be different. They're the people who are innovating in forms like audio slideshows and live blogging. They're the people who are doing investigations with data journalism. They're the people who are engaging with online communities. So, um, so I wanted to create an MA which was worthy of a master's level um, certification and, and allowed students to define the medium and to push the boundaries of the medium that they were working in. Um, so the, the way that it does that is, is it, um, it gives students an introduction to a broad range of, of key skills uh, in online journalism, but gives them, in a sense, gives them a bit of a nudge to, to experiment and, and to produce high quality in-depth work. Um, so there are parts of a course where they have to experiment. There's, there's an element which is called an, an, an experimental portfolio. So it's a, it's a space where they can try something that, that might be um, intimidating to them, but they're not going to necessarily fail if they don't pull it off as long as they've learned something in the process. Can you give and me along a that, Sorry? No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, and then alongside that, there, there are more traditional portfolios of work. There's a lot of working with clients. So they take industry problems and research those and, and try new ways of addressing those. And that, that might be anything from uh, how do you make online video successful to how do you um, train citizen journalists. Um, and they all come out with very different skills and, and, and very unique uh, reputations, really. A lot of them build reputations on the course. And um, and so far, every single one of them has found a job, which is incredibly unusual. That's fantastic. So, most of them at strategic levels as well, which is which is also encouraging. So they are genuinely going into positions where they are um, shaping worthy news industry goals next. That's fantastic. Um, can you can you explain a little bit about what data journalism is? So data journalism is well, it's quite a broad um, range of skills, really. But in a nutshell, it's it's using um, data, structured information, at some point in the process of getting or telling a story. So it's quite a, a vague definition, but in practice that means someone could be um, collecting data uh, in, in a way that uh, might be hard for other people. It might be that they tell a story about that um, data or public data um, again, in a way that other people aren't doing. Or it might be that they use new storytelling techniques like data visualization, um, interactives, databases, things like that, um, to communicate the, the story. There, like I said, there are quite a wide range of skills involved potentially, and quite often there are collaborative projects that, um, that allow different people with different skills to do that. Is that uh, also what you mean by computer-assisted reporting? It's it really it's grown out of computer assisted reporting for me and and so computer assisted reporting is is it was really um, it came to prominence in the U.S. from the late sixties um, through into the eighties and nineties and that's for me is using spreadsheets and databases to find stories. Um, the difference with data journalism is that that you're now starting to do that in a networked environment so you might be um, accessing data on other computers. You might be allowing users to access that data and do things with it and, and make maps and so on. So it, so it does it does include what traditionally has been called computer-assisted reporting, but I think it also takes in a number of other um, techniques. You know, you've got design skills, you've got web development skills that traditionally, you know, are, are new things really, I guess. Okay. Um, in your online journalism blog, you mentioned that you support experiments with wiki journalism. Can you explain a little bit about um, what that is and why it interests you? <laughs> well, uh, that was um, th there was a period, probably I guess a, a couple years after Wikipedia came to prominence, when journalists and news organisations were experimenting with wikis as a way to again tell stories and engage with audiences and. Um, 
that that was uh, I did some research at the time into what worked and what didn't and 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 different ways of doing that um and it, it was it was it has been a really interesting way for news organizations and journalists to collaborate with users you've got all sorts of knowledge out there in um what used to be an audience a traditional audience which now you can obviously access and and publish as a, as a news organization and and wikis i guess were one of the earliest attempts to do that in in some sort of um structured way and you had some interesting examples where newspapers would say we're going to do a wiki on our local music scene and can you help us add entries for all the bands that you know of and the venues and and all the rest of that and and it's something that you wouldn't necessarily do as a journalist but but is a tremendous community effort of of sharing information and expertise um for, for something which everyone benefits from and enjoys um I think you're seeing less of that now. I think that the novelty of wikis has worn off and, and people are interested in other things now. But the, the potential is still there. I think increasingly you now get specialist either wikis or people use Wikipedia. Um, so, for example, if you're a Lego fan, then there's Brickipedia for you. And if you're a Star Wars fan, there's Wikipedia. And, you know, um, there are all sorts of specialist wikis now. And, and I guess if you're interested in one of those areas, you will contribute to one of those wikis. Um, can you talk a little bit about HelpMeInvestigate.com, um, how it got started and some of its successes? Uh, well, again, this this kind of came out of some research that I did for a, a book chapter. I was asked to do a, a, a chapter for a, the second edition of a book called Investigative Journalism, um, which is edited by Hugo de Berg. And um, they asked me to do a chapter on um, investigative journalism online. And in the process of looking at that and, and, and writing this book chapter, I looked at a few examples of crowdsourcing. And it really struck me as, um, this is, by the way, crowdsourcing is, is obviously the idea that you uh, gather information from a number of different people. So you allow users somehow to contribute to an investigation or a story. Um, and when I looked at crowdsourcing and investigative journalism, I found some really interesting characteristics about uh, the engagement, for example. So uh, the, there was a particular example of, a, of an investigation by the Florida News Press, which had tremendous levels of traffic. Uh, the, the traffic on that story was higher than pretty much any other story on the site um, that they'd ever done, apart from hurricane kind of season stories. So that's relatively unusual for investigative journalism yes you get big scoops and yes they make a lot of noise but in terms of how many people actually read that um you know you're always struggling i think with investigative journalism to get people to care about something that's important so the engagement around that was really interesting and the other factor that struck me was uh you could use crowdsourcing to do investigations that traditional news organizations would not normally do in, in other words on fashionable subjects um, subjects that didn't have a mass audience or that didn't warrant a particular amount of effort um, and so it opened up new possibilities editorially um, so that kind of I guess led me to to um, come up with the idea for help me investigate which was really a, a, a way of systematically testing how could you crowdsource investigative journalism and, and was there a way of doing it more successfully um, you know what, what would be the techniques for doing that and um, uh, after a, a year or two of developing that idea I, I got some funding from Channel 4 a, a television company in the UK and we launched that in 2009 uh, and it's been running for, for four years now in fact it just celebrated of all um, very quiet without any noise at all um, it's fourth anniversary, and um, and it, it's we've we've just been investigating different um, questions, anything that people raise or that approach us with, and uh, and it's just a network of people. It's completely non-profit. It's completely voluntary. There is no business model because there are no costs. But we work with news organisations, including the Guardian, the BBC, um, local newspapers, uh, newspapers in Germany. You know, we, we've we've done things um, 
all sorts of different things with different organizations and um and it's it's really just a way of of trying to use network technologies the internet um to put people in touch with other people who might want to help each other investigate something um speaking of the internet um what's your view of the recent sale of the washington post to jeff bezos um the founder and ceo of amazon.com it, it doesn't surprise me at all in fact um, funnily enough, I was predicting that I think for the last two years I've been saying that um, Facebook, Amazon, or Google will buy will start buying news um, organizations at some point. What surprises me is, is that it isn't Amazon; it's it's um, it's Bezos. Mm -hmm. And um, but having said that, he's not the first. Um, I can't remember who it was, but one of the kind of founders of Facebook bought. Um, one of the news magazines in the US, I can't remember which one. Um, there are other examples of, of either people who've made their money from the web or, or organisations, uh, web companies, buying traditional media properties. And, um, and I think that's going to continue. Um, it, it, it does open up some interesting possibilities in terms of what he's going to actually do. Um, and uh, and, that, and that's probably more interesting than the sale itself. But it's any print organisation, I think, has, has got a very difficult challenge in in trying to straddle new opportunities and and, and where things are growing, while also not losing the, the massive revenue um, that that uh, that still comes from print. And also, you know, ultimately, they've still got people in jobs. That they can't just chuck out the window, so mm -hmm. you, you, you know you've got a whole workforce there, which um, which is something um, you've got to work with. So you think this is a potentially good thing? Um, I'm I'm always hesitant to to kind of say something is good or bad because it's always going to be mixed, and um, so I guess that would be my my prediction. Okay. If anything, I think it is. A thing which will have both good and bad consequences, and um, there, you know there, we will always make mistakes, particularly with with change. So, but we learn things along the way. Okay, um, switching to your book, the subject of your books, um, the first book you published on Lean Pub was Scraping for Journalists. Can you explain a little bit about the book, like for example, what scraping is um, and why it's important for journalists? Okay, yeah. I mean, scraping is the process of getting information from um, a series of web pages or documents online or even just one web page. Um, and how you get that information from that web page or those web pages, it, it normally involves creating some sort of script, which is a set of instructions. Um, and that, so that's scraping. Scraping is essentially writing a set of instructions to grab information from the web. Um, now, there are a number of ways you can do that. You can get tools where you click buttons that, that write those instructions. Um, and you, you tell it what information you want and where it is, and you kind of press play, and off it goes and gets that. Um, but if you want to get something that's more complicated or or for example it's in pdfs or it's in spreadsheets then you might have to actually write um something more advanced and, and write some programming and the book really takes you um, across those tools and those skills so it, so it starts from a very simple scraper which is just using google spreadsheets to grab information from a web page it takes you from that to the kind of click and um, play tools that will scrape pages for you and then right through to learning some programming to write scrapers. Um, now the reason that that's important is that obviously there are you know millions of pages of information out there that are potentially of interest to journalists and a lot of those pages include government data, um, information about um, health, education, all the sorts of issues that we're supposed to be reporting on as journalists. And, and it allows us to check facts. It allows us to identify problems. It allows us to identify trends. Um, it's not just hard news. It can be softer subjects like sport and fashion. Um, 
And quite often scraping is, a, is a, a really useful technique for getting hold of that data when you either couldn't get hold of it in any other way or the of alternative methods take a lot of time, like freedom of information requests. Um, so that's, that's really what scraping is about and, and uh, why it's important. The other part of the book is that I'd kind of been trying to teach this to journalists for a while. And I'd found that there was a disconnect between how journalists saw scraping and how programmers saw scraping. And, and basically, journalists quite often come from a humanities background where they learn in a particular way. Programmers, I've noticed, operate differently. They're more like scientists. They work through trial and error. They um, borrow from each other. Um, they don't expect to learn everything and then that body of knowledge is all they need to know. It's interesting you have a great line in your book where you say, um, if you were used to getting things right the first time in school and college, get unused to it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's the sort of, that was the hurdle, I think, that I saw in, in, in doing this in training and also learning it myself, you know, trying to learn scraping and kind of, I'd, I'd read books about programming languages and, and I'd be kind of like, well, this is great. I know how to write a script that adds two numbers together, but how does that help me get data from that web page? Um, and I could see that journalists, you know, that they want results, um, and they're not going to read a whole book on a pro, you know, on a particular programming language, and you know, and and then feel satisfied that they can write a script. Or so. Um, so it was as much about that as about anything. It was much about a way of learning and, and about saying forget that, that idea of you know getting everything right you're going to get things wrong and actually the fun of scraping and, and i really enjoy scraping because it is like solving puzzles and that's the fun is making mistakes and, and, mm -hmm. and solving them and coming up against problems and it's you know it's um it's sudoku really i have um uh, what might be a very specific question about that but um i was wondering so for example if you wrote a story based on some data that you'd scraped and then let's say um, one of the subjects of the story later changed the data on their website, how would you establish for, uh, some kind of audit trail um, proving where you got the data from? That's a really good question, actually. I mean, I, mean, I imagine the audit trail would be the scraper and, and the, um, essentially the, the metadata um, that that scraper recorded at the time of being run. So you would be able to prove okay. that this scraper ran at this time and it, and it grabbed this information from this URL. Um, it, you know, it really, if, if, the, if, if this was a court case and they had to seize computers or whatever, and those computers would be able to back up that information. And it'd be very, it, you know, say, for example, the other party says that you falsified that again they could check well is there a way that this could have been falsified no these logs are have not been manipulated so um so that would be i mean that's getting into too much depth really all you'd have to do practically speaking is go on google and and search for a cache or go on the way back machine and all their computers would be seized and you'd be able to to kind of look at the previous versions of the pages that are on and, and when changes were made and so on. So there's always going to be an audit trail really on both sides. Okay. Um, in, the, in the introduction to the book, you mentioned that it's being published in progress and that readers can influence what gets written and how. Can you give me an example of how reader feedback has influenced what you've um, included in the book? Um, well, I, I guess this week I've had a tweet from someone who says, who said that there is a, a, a particular page that I'd used as an example in, in the book, which um, was no longer online. Um, so I went back in and I've, I've changed that passage in the book now, so, that's, so that doesn't include a mention of that. Um, someone else um, suggested all kinds of alternative ways of, of doing a particular, um, creating a particular process in the book. Um, so I, I've, I've added quite a lengthy section at the end of that chapter, which uh says you know this is what this person says here's another way of doing it um and it's much better because of x y and z so 
people have, have picked up typos, people have picked up um, um, things that have changed, people have made suggestions of different ways of doing things. Um, another thing that's happened is new tools, so people have, have suggested alternative tools. I had a great case where someone in, I think it was Portugal or um, Spain, where they said that Google Docs or Google Drive in their language doesn't use commas, it uses semicolons. Huh. So so you get these kind of small idiosyncrasies that you know you can, I added into the um into the book as a as a little alert box saying um if you're using you know the Spanish or or Portuguese uh, and there was another language as well, it might have been German, then use a semicolon here instead. Just small things like that which That's great. never be able to do in print. And the kind of thing that if you're especially if you're learning programming for the first time, the kind of thing that could it really frustrate someone, right? Because you see you're, you're copying what you're being shown and you know you're doing it right. Um, but even, you know, the difference between a comma and something else can break everything that you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and people, and even, you know, you can try and anticipate people making mistakes or misunderstanding or having problems, but, but having people road test in the book and say, you know, this doesn't work or, um, I made this mistake at first. So then you can add just a little passage or you might want to rewrite a sentence so that it's clearer. That that makes a big difference. Um, your, your second Lean Pub book, which you co-authored with Carol Myers, was 8,000 Holes, How the 2012 Olympic Torch Relay Lost Its Way. Can you tell me what led you to write this book and what it's about? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great story, at least to me. Anyway, I think <laughs> it's fascinating. But, um, this, this came out of scraping. I, I was... Um, to cut a long story short, I, I, I scraped details on the uh, on the Olympic torch bearers, and there were supposed to be eight. Well, there were eight thousand of them. Um, this is and for they the published. This was for the two thousand and twelve Olympics, right. yes, in, in the UK. And um, the official website published details on all of the torch bearers. Um, so I scraped that information and started to investigate. Um, all sorts of things about them. So we we did dozens of stories about the torchbearers, everything from um, who was the oldest torchbearer through to um, these these stories that appeared on the front pages of the national newspapers about um, corporate torchbearers. Uh, so to cut uh, the 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 main story that that was told um, as a result of this was that. A number of corporate sponsors of the Olympics had um, nominated their own executives to carry the Olympic torch. What was important about that was that when the Olympic torch relay was announced in London, they made a promise that it would be um, about people who were inspirational, who had sporting achievements, who were young. 50% of the torchbearers were supposed to be young. 95%, uh, I think it was 95% of the torch relay places were going to be made available to the public. So it was very much about celebrating people, you know, everyday people, uh, uh, inspirational people, and so on. It wasn't about executives. And in fact, it, the, the Olympics minister said that they had issued guidelines to the sponsors saying do not nominate executives. Now, it turned out that dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of executives carried the torch. And um, and it was clearly being used to build corporate relationships or corporate partners got them and so on. Um, and that was the story that, that I found early on in the process of looking at the details of the torch bearers. But as the torch relay progressed... I wanted to tell a deeper story, really, about how that had happened, um, because it's one thing to say, "Well, these um, these corporate executives are carrying torches that are supposed to be for um, kind of uh, normal people," but it's another thing to actually tell the story of, of, "Well, why did that happen, and why is it important?" Yeah, you tell a very it's moving story in the book about um, an athlete with brittle bone, brittle, bro brittle bone syndrome. Um, who ended up not um, being able to carry the torch and then discovered that there were all sorts of people who hadn't done. Um, and, and, and he had to go through a very long process of being nominated and rounds of assessment. Um, and then, you know, was disappointed to find out that he wasn't included in the relay. 
um, even though a bunch of people who hadn't done anything nearly as um, sporting or inspirational um, were included in the relay. Yeah, I think, and that that was what it came down to is is um, as the torch relay came towards its final weeks, um, I wanted to write the full story of why this mattered and what had happened. So, so we started the book with the story of Jack Binstead, who was um, I think seventeen. So he he fitted the, the criteria of youth. He um, had broken sixty odd bones since he'd been born. Um, and he was probably going to compete at the next Paralympics. Um, uh, he was nominated by the maximum number of people, but he didn't carry the torch. And as you say, on the day that he probably would have carried the torch, there was this long list of uh, marketing executives and, and chief executives and political donors, um, all of whom were carrying the torch instead. And um, I mean, it, it's sad that uh, I recently found out that um, he's retired from the sport he's he's not going to be competing at the Rio no. Olympics he's decided to quit wheelchair racing and you do wonder had he been successfully nominated to carry the torch would he would he have retired um so that was why this story mattered and and as you I'm, I'm glad you you think it's moving because yes. it certainly uh, moved me and 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 moved me to to um set up the, the book on the site so that um, all the uh, people could get it for free but they could but any kind of purchases went straight to the brittle bone society and, and lean pub was kind enough to volunteer to donate the uh, the lean pub share to the brittle bone society as well so 100 percent pretty much goes to them um then we also closed the book with the story of a person who did carry the torch um but also found the experience sullied really by the fact that also carrying the torch when he was 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 a bunch of people who got to carry the torch because they'd sold the most bottles of coca-cola that month right um yeah yeah um yeah that's uh that that's it, it's that kind of thing that the, the that that moved me about it the the sort of the contrast between a person who had strived to do things of of olympic kinds in order to carry the torch and then the i don't know the kind of ugly vanity of someone who's merely doing it so they can brag about it at a dinner party or something like that yeah it's it's um it's a shame really and even after all of that there were, there were probably a good thousand or so torchbearers who were never named on the site and um and i know at least one of us is an executive um of, of a sports retailer that um that was never named and never identified and his two daughters managed to carry it as well wow it's, it's a family affair but yeah. um but yeah so it was it was um it was a really interesting exercise to try to tell the full story and 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 detail all the various um twists and turns of that i can see you're working on a new book on lean pub called data journalism heist um can you yes. talk a little bit about that this is, this is, I guess, me trying to keep it simple after doing scraping for journalists, which um, was very. Uh, it's quite a long book. It's it's um, it takes you from a very simple starting point to to somewhere that's quite advanced, and um, I wanted to do something which was very introductory, very basic, very short. Um, was for people who. Uh, we're nowhere near scraping, really, and we're just interested in data journalism generally. So it's it's going to be a very short book, which teaches a couple of um, simple techniques in spreadsheets to find basic stories in a simple data set. Okay. Um, it's probably more like a very long article than an ebook, um, and um, that's the, the, the idea. There is that hopefully. Um, a lot of people will use that, will get interested in data journalism, and then they might want to start to explore some of the more advanced techniques like scraping. And, and, um, and I'm hoping to do some other books around other data journalism techniques as well. Okay. Um, switching gears a little, I'd like to ask you some questions about your experience with LeanPub and the Lean Publishing process. Um, can you tell me how you found out about LeanPub and why you chose us for your publishing platform? A, a colleague of mine at um, Birmingham City University, a guy called Andrew Dubber, oh, he yes. 
used Lean Pub to publish, well, he still uses Lean Pub to publish all sorts of books on the music industry. And um, I'd been looking at ebook publishing for a while, and, and he'd mentioned it in conversation. Um, I, I liked the idea that you could uh, continually publish, and that was the, the main selling point for me. So I'd obviously looked at other ebook publishing platforms and, and so on. But the, the, the way that this seemed to be designed to allow you to start publishing and then keep adding to something, um, that that was the, the key thing for me. And, um, and particularly for something where technology is changing. And in fact, I myself was, was still making that journey and still learning things. Um, so that's how I got into it, really. And did you know Markdown before you started using LeanPub? No. Okay. What was the experience like learning that? <laughs> <laughs> what, was that a was that a a, a barrier to you, um, or was it just something you picked up easily? Um, it's um, it's um, it was a barrier. Yeah, I mean, not not a huge one, but um, I'd, I think I'd kind of uh, stumbled across it a little bit. And I don't think I don't know if I'd ever used it, but um, it was something that I kind of think well that might stop a few people, um, and um, you know occasionally it will still trip you up. But um, I think I think it's it, once once you've kind of got the basics of it, it's it's largely just things like images and and having to remember. I think you kind of occasionally have to think, how do I do an image again? And you have right. to kind of look at another chapter that's got an image and, and just copy the syntax and, and paste it into your new chapter. Um, and I only recently discovered the asides, the kind of different things that you could use to create information boxes or question boxes or discussion boxes. And um, so I went, I went back all the way through the book finding mm. things that would say, oh, you know, that's, that's really an information box. I'm, I'm going to change that now. But um, so yes, yeah, so there were those hidden gems as well. I think that's that's probably more of a selling point, actually, that the um, the special codes for asides. Yeah, and markdown, markdown, of course, um, is 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 um, a great way of of making it so that you can write one single source text, um, but then output in multiple um, ebook formats and even even HTML, of course, which is what Markdown was designed for. Yeah, I actually, funnily enough, I use it now for other things as well. So huh. I've, I've just finished writing a book chapter for um, uh, for a, a, a print book, and um, and I wrote it in Markdown, copied it into a Markdown converter, <laughs> and then um, and then copied it uh, and then into, if you like, a word processing document because it just it means I can type it on the train just in a text editor and, yeah. uh, and not have to um, think about that. That's, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's fantastic. great, great for us to hear. Um, um, I see you have a Facebook page for Scraping for Journalists. Um, is engaging directly with people who have already bought your books important to you? And is there more we can do at LeanPub to help you engage with your readers online? So you broke up a little bit oh, there on the, on the yeah. question. I, I'm, I'll try asking it again. Um, I see you have a Facebook page for Scraping for Journalists. Is engaging directly with people who have already bought your books important to you? And is there more we could do at LeanPub to help you engage with your readers online? It, it's definitely um, important to me to, to, to engage. And uh, I guess the Facebook page doesn't do a lot about it. It, has, it is a channel for people to point out things or, or ask questions. Um, but because I'm a lot more active on Twitter, um, I, I tend to get people contacting me on the, uh, or occasionally through email. But um, so the Facebook page is really there as a point of contact, more than anything else. Um, and um, and it's, I'll just publish anything that that I find about scraping will get published on there. But it's it's um, nothing much else happens there, I guess. Um, although I did use it to announce new chapters now and i guess that's probably where it could be better integrated with lean pub in that you could kind of say right when I, when i publish a new chapter don't just email readers but also um, update facebook or update the, the twitter uh, account if there's one for that oh that's very interesting 
uh, for that for the book. So, for example, I've got a Twitter account for the online journalism handbook, but I didn't think it was necessarily to create one for scraping for journalists. Um, so that kind of, uh, I guess, having that, that involves different ways of being updated. Um, and then, I guess, hmm. also as part of that, thinking about it, when someone buys the book, they obviously make a choice whether to get updates. Now, they could choose to um, either get that via email or they could follow the Facebook page or they could even follow the Twitter account from that single point. Um, that might be a, a, a different way of approaching it, I guess. Okay. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, is there anything generally that you think we could improve or any other features that you'd really like to see? I guess I had to go off and find a markdown um, editor converter type thing. Um, and uh, so having something on the site where you could uh, type in markdown and see what it would look like, that, uh, that might be quite a nice addition because I imagine that is an obstacle for a lot of people. Um, I was thinking about it. So I, I, I actually downloaded the purchases, the, the spreadsheet of, um, of purchase data. Right. And the one piece of data that's missing, this is quite geeky, but the minimum price and the recommended price. Um, yes. I, I would like to be able to know what they were when someone bought because I've actually done quite a few experiments in seeing what happens to buyer behavior when someone, um, depending on the pricing, so if, if you've got a, a minimum price and a recommended price and they're different, what do people do? Okay. 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 That's great. That's okay. actually, exactly. that's something we've given a little bit of thought to and it's, um, it's validating to hear that, 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 um, that um, authors out there are actually thinking about that because that's, that's great. Um, no, I, I think pricing is really interesting actually. It's, I mean, one of the reasons I, I use LeanPub as well was, was to learn about ebook publishing. And um, because I, because I'm also dealing with journalists who are looking at this themselves, and um, and that that kind of the idea of having a recommended price and a minimum price is a really interesting dynamic. And for example, I found uh, for a while I made them both the same, and I noticed people almost never paid more than the recommended price when it was the minimum. But if they are different, people do spend more than the recommended price. That's very interesting. Interesting. And obviously, a lot of them spend the minimum. Um, and in that, and when I did look at those figures, it averaged out still at the recommended price. But it was interesting that people would pay more as well as less when there's an option. Have you done any um, special one-day promotions or anything like that, like where you lower the price or give out coupons? No. Um, what I, I, I may well do that in the future. What I've really done is more of a of a, 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 a gradual pricing. So for the, I think for the first week I said it was four ninety nine. So anyone who buys it in the first week when there's only four, one chapter, it was four ninety nine, and then it went up to nine ninety nine, and it kind of kept in, it would increase as more chapters were added. Um, even though obviously everyone got all the chapters in the end, so it was kind of me saying, you know, I know that you're buying something and you don't know yet what it's going to be, so I'm reducing the price to recognize that and also recognize that the people who buy it at the start are quite important. Um, so I've not really done any price promotions in terms of reductions or anything like that. I might look at that in the future. I mean, at the moment, sales are pretty constant and have been throughout the 13 months or so. Um, but I may look at it in the future. Um, so no. Okay. Well, that's about all the questions I had. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think you covered it all, yes. Okay, well, thanks quite for... A, quite a wide range of ground, I think, we've covered there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank, thanks for a great interview um, and for being on the Lean Publishing Podcast and for being a Lean Pub author. No, thank you, and thank you as well. It's, um, it's, as I say, it's very educational.